Okay, we're doing something a little bit different today. Many of you may not be used to seeing my face, and that's because I don't usually do videos like this. Most of my channel is focused around doing Bible review videos. But today I wanted to do a topical video, an opinion-based video, on 10 Bible features that I personally do not like. Now, however erroneous you think my opinion is, uh, I'm still a brother in Christ. I just want to put that out here in, in, at the forefront. Uh, in case the comment section gets a little bit intense, uh, just remember, I still love Jesus, you know, just the same as you guys. Oh, well, at least most of you guys who watch my channel. Uh, and so please keep that in mind when you're commenting below. I do want to hear your opinions, whether you disagree with me or agree with me. If you want to list your own personal dislikes about certain Bible features or even some of your favorite Bible features, I'd like to hear it down below. And please, uh, uh, list your reason why you like or dislike these certain things. I'd like to potentially change my mind about it because for me personally, other people's opinions and passions and perspectives have changed uh, my personal taste in Bibles. I used to be a double column only advocate and then a brother showed me a single column Bible and instructed me to use it and uh, see if I liked it. And now Single column Bibles are my absolute favorite type of layout, especially if you're the ESV Heritage. Thank you, Heritage, for being the best Bible layout of all time. Anyways, starting off with number one, the first feature that I do not like seeing in a Bible is red letter. Uh, and what red letter is, if you guys don't know, many of you do, it's when the words of Jesus Christ in the New Testament are highlighted in red rather than used being just a plain black text like the rest of Scripture. There are a couple reasons why I personally do not like it. The first reason is because context. I really enjoy uh, contextualizing scripture. Uh, I like reading Jesus' words, but not just Jesus' words, but the context around that because it uh, helps you know what the true meaning of the text is, what the purpose of the writer is to include Jesus' words, things like that. I think it's important for me personally to not have my eye drawn to just one part of the text, but to see it as a whole. Now, I understand many of your guys' opinions. You like to see Jesus' words highlighted because they're of the utmost importance. I mean, he brought in the New Covenant and the New Testament. He's supposed to be our shepherd. We're supposed to follow him, emulate him, imitate him. And so it totally makes sense why you'd want to differentiate his words from the rest of Scripture. But for me personally, that's a blinder. Now, also, I really like the uniformity of a black letter text. I like how it looks. It's much easier to read. It's more aesthetically pleasing, in my opinion. I don't really have a theological leaning on including or not including red letter. It's not theological whatsoever. It's mostly just aesthetic. Uh, and also, it's not difficult for me to read red letter. It is more difficult, especially in interior lighting and in the natural lighting. It's much easier to read, in my opinion. But many people do struggle reading red letter. And so uh, that's worth putting out there. Many of you guys may know the NKJV Shepherd uh, does blue letter Bibles. I still am not a big fan of blue letter, differentiating the words of Christ. But it is much closer to black in having a high contrast to white paper. So that may be something worth considering if you're looking at a McLaren Bible or even potentially a Shepherd. So, or a... Uh, or a lion. The lion does the same thing. Uh, so anyways, number two, the second Bible feature I don't like seeing is verse by verse with no pilcrows uh, or bold verse numbers. Now what pilcrows and bold verse numbers do in a verse by verse Bible is to know when the paragraph begins in that passage. So you'll see commonly in paragraph style Bibles uh, to uh, to show you the, the flow of the, the passage itself and the rhythm of the passage uh, and how you should be reading it, uh, the tone of the, the chapter itself. Uh, it changes a lot based on how you denote uh, the different paragraph structures. And so without Pilcrows, without the bold verse numbers, you don't really know when the paragraphs uh, begin and end. And so maybe you guys are able to read verse by verse in spite of that. Maybe the flow and the rhythm of the passage uh, it doesn't cause misunderstanding or, or ruin your reading experience. But for me personally, I can't stand that. And it's already bad enough that verse by verse even exists. Uh, I see its use case, but why not just pick up Scholar Quintel with the bold verse numbers? Uh, we didn't even have verse numbers back in the day. Uh, they are useful. I will say they are very useful. But... Uh, 
I think verse by verse is absolutely horrendous, especially if you're a single column verse by verse Bible. Uh, I, I can't stand, that's the absolute worst Bible layout of all time. I mean, just get a uh, LSB two column verse by verse. That looks so cool, unless it doesn't have pale crows and bold verse numbers. If it doesn't have that, don't pick it up. Pick up a two column verse by verse with those things. I think it looks much nicer. But anyways, that's for a different video, totally different video. Number three, the third feature that I don't like seeing is stacked ribbons. Many of you guys have experience with this, whether you've got the CSB large print thin line, or if you've got the uh, uh, heirloom collection uh, from Crossway, any of those Bibles. They, what they do is they glue the two ribbons, they stack them on top of each other and glue them in the same exact spot at the top of the Bible underneath the headband. What that can cause is when you put the Bible ribbons in the pages, not only are the ribbons hard to set, but it can also cause the Bible pages to tear when you're turning them. They're much more at risk of damage. And so definitely not a big fan. Uh, it doesn't look aesthetically pleasing either, but they're, they're mostly just really difficult to use. But that's just a small gripe. Number four, uh, fake readers Bibles. I got to explain myself a little bit here. So many of you guys are familiar with Bibliotheca. They totally changed the Bible ecosystem. And bringing in a Bible that didn't have chapter numbers, didn't have verse numbers, didn't have subheadings. It was just purely the text of scripture. Uh, I believe they did include the book, the titles of the books of the Bible. And that's the only denotation they make. I could be wrong about that. You can correct me in the comments below. Uh, but it totally changed the Bible ecosystem. And tons of publishers started making readers Bibles. But many of these Bibles, pub, Bible, Bible publishers couldn't let go of what we're used to seeing in, in the modern age, uh, the, the chapter and verse divisions, and even sometimes the subheadings. And so a lot of times they'll put uh, the chapter and verse numbers uh, on the outer column like the Traveris does, or sometimes they'll still include them in the text, and then it's just a single column Bible. I don't even know why you call it a reader's Bible. Even Holman with the CSB and their reader set, they denote the chapter divisions, not by the chapter number that we would be used to, but they just separate it and put a lot of space between the last paragraph of, of the, that chapter and then the first paragraph of the next chapter, chapter. And then the first letter at the beginning of each chapter, they bold and put in a blue highlight. And so you can tell it's a new chapter and it totally separates that, that uh, piece of text from the remaining text in that book. I think, that, I, I think that's an issue, especially in the book of Romans, where they have really awkward chapter divisions for whatever reason. And it, it kind of ruins the pacing. It, it makes that division where there generally wouldn't be a division in the original text of scripture, when that, the one that the original church had, because uh, they didn't have chapter and verse divisions back, back then. That was introduced over a thousand years after the fact and so uh, it's important, I think, for us today, especially uh, here in our culture today, we like to memorize the scriptures and it's much easier. There's a lot of utility with having chapter divisions and verse, di uh, verse number divisions. I think it's okay to have a Bible like that uh, for your main Bible. But for a reader set, this is a totally different experience we're having. We're not gonna use a reader set as our primary Bible. Very few people are gonna do that. So we want a regular Bible, and then we want our reader set to just be the text of Scripture, how the original church would have had it. And so it doesn't make sense to me why a reader's Bible would function like a regular Bible, because it's not supposed to do that. Anyways, I digress. My opinion was too long on that one. I was a little bit passionate. Number five, most of this, uh, uh, this particular feature I've experienced with the New King James and Thomas Nelson and... and what it is, is when uh, ref references, the cross-references in a reference Bible are in the same location as the translator notes, and they just mix them together. Uh, I think translator notes and cross-references have totally different use cases, uh, and when you want to use one particular one, it's nice to go straight to the translator notes and use it how you're supposed to use it. And then when you need to use cross-references, going to that section where they are and using them. But Thomas Nelson in the New King James Bible uh, puts it together. Uh, especially near the bottom of the page. And uh, generally, it's the translator notes that get lost in the mess of the page. So when you want to use a translator note, uh, it can be difficult to look at it. It's important for the New King James to have accessible translator notes because that's one of the biggest benefits of that particular Bible is that they clearly list 
variants of scripture, a lot of them too. Not every single one, of course, there's too many in uh, the current manuscripts we have. But enough that it warrants looking at from time to time. And there's so many of them, and they're notated really well, and they tell you from which manuscript family that it comes from. But if it gets lost in the sauce, uh, it's difficult to go to those different translator notes. And so even though the Strident is one of the worst layouts imaginable, it's a single column, verse by verse. I'm sorry, it's an amazing Bible scholar, but I hate the layout. At the bottom of the page, they make the division, a small line division in between the translator note and then the cross references uh, respectively on either side of the page. I also like what Lachman does with their uh, reference Bible where they do a similar small line put the cross references on the bottom and it's a double column uh, underneath underneath each column they have the translator notes right underneath that column and then there's the line division and then the translator notes and so they do a really good job separating them and they're really really easy to use because they're right under the the particular column that they're referencing anyways number six many of you are really going to disagree with me but bibles that are too floppy I don't know about you guys, actually, maybe I do, but uh, I don't like reading my Bible like this, especially the bigger floppy Bibles. I can't read my Bible like this. Uh, I don't know why many of you feel like you want to tame a floppy beast of a Bible, especially those larger 9 by 6 Bibles. I can't even stuff those Bibles in a in a bag properly and then trust it'll just sit well on its own because it'll flop everywhere in the bag and the pages will fold in on itself and then crease and all that and damage the pages. And then I, I don't want to walk to church and, and I'm walking to church holding my Bible and then it's like uh, in, in the wind and everything and it folds and flops on itself or when, I, when I'm holding my Bible, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to swaddle my Bible. I want to hold it with one hand, easily accessible. Uh, I don't want to swaddle it even just with one arm. Not my entire small little Filipino, look, us Filipino guys, we don't get very big, okay? I, I'm not trying to hold my Bible with my entire tiny arm span. Anyways, I digress. I think one of the greatest examples of a large Bible that's not too floppy is the NKJV Shepherd. It, it's a really thick, nine by six Bible, a really large Bible. And yet I can hold it near the spine and it lays pretty flat. And even if I just hold it up like this, it doesn't flop like crazy over my hand, despite being huge, insanely big. I absolutely love that Bible. So number seven, Bibles without footnotes or with condensed footnotes. Now the LSB, they fixed that issue. Their first editions didn't have footnotes. So I think that's an issue. I think it, it's worth listing footnotes, especially the variants in the manuscripts. Many of our Bible manuscripts for the text of Scripture don't agree on the same reading. Now, it's not huge. It's not a huge difference, and it doesn't at all affect our core doctrine. But I think it's important to be transparent about many of the important uh, uh, manuscript differences to weigh and see like what could the, the, the text of Scripture be actually saying. And then... You, based on your own conviction and your own research, you can determine which passage of text you think you lean towards. I think that's really important, especially as a New King James reader, or if you read the BSB, or even if you read the CSB uh, or the NET, I think those both have really good footnotes also. It's important that if they've published a full footnote system, they should include the full footnote system, no matter what, even if the Bible is a compact Bible, if it's a pocket Bible, whatever. These different manuscript differences could have been the original text of scripture. It could have been in the autographs. Why wouldn't we want to list that in the footnotes just in case? Uh, Thomas Nelson does a lot of condensed editions of the translator note system. I'd like for them to include the full set. They, they already have a full footnote um, system published. Just include it in all your editions. That's my personal conviction. Not a huge deal for me. But generally, I will not buy a Bible if it has a condensed foot sy footnote system or a not good footnote system or none at all. Anyways, chapter 8. This is getting crazy. I'm saying crazy stuff. Chapter 8. Uh, number 8, the feature that I do not like to see in Bibles is a small gutter margin. 
many of you guys saw my last video, the CSB single column personal size. The only reason I cannot stand that Bible, I can't read it, it was otherwise perfect, is because the gutter margin is too small. There's really no positive thing about including a small gutter margin. You can't take notes in it, you can't put symbols in it, and the text of scripture uh, dives deep into the inner margin if the gutter margin is tiny. And so it's difficult to read it, especially holding it in one hand, or if the Bible has a really tight binding uh, and it causes the pages to curve even more inside, well, then you're it's, it's a mess, it's even worse. And so small gutter margins, don't include them. There's no purpose. It's okay if your if your Bible is a little bit wider. If it, if it, if it's a boxy Bible, that's okay. Like we have Clarions, we've got our Aquilas. We're used to the boxy Bibles. We've got our diadems. Okay, it's nothing we're averse to. Okay, anyways, number nine. When the binding is too tight, when the signatures are sewn really tightly, that it causes the pages to uh, crinkle and uh, and and get wavy in the gutter. Or when there's too much reinforcement and it causes the Bible to be really stiff, it likes to close on itself, especially at the end and the beginning of the Bible pages. Um, reinforcement is important. Good binding is important. We want our Bibles to last a really long time. But if it, if it affects the reading experience, it's totally not worth it. I mean, yes, glued, glued bindings don't last as long as a really good reinforced sewn binding. However, another really awful feature about glued Bibles is that they like to close on themselves, even in the middle of the Bible. And they're really stiff. It's hard to read anything that's close to the gutter. But uh, if you have a really well reinforced Bible, like really, really reinforced and a tight binding, you get that same glued Bible binding experience. Many sewn bindings in Bibles, like the Clarion here, advertise flat Flat lay, laying flat Bibles, where the Bible will open up and it'll lay completely fat, flat, making it really easy to read. So, I think it's an issue if we're not able to do that with our really nice premium Bibles. Anyways, number 10, uh, last and probably least, uh, cheap plastic feeling paper. I know all of you will agree with me on that. I don't know anyone who wants cheap plastic feeling paper. Many economical editions nowadays have come out with really good paper, and it hasn't raised the price all that much. Like Lockman has the 33 GSM Korean paper. It's really creamy, it's really nice, has a nice feel, it's a good thickness, and the, and the ghosting is very minimal, no bleed through whatsoever. The CSB Thin Line that I just reviewed not too long ago, amazing Chinese paper. Even though it's printed in China, it has a really nice feel, it's quite soft, has a good texture, and the ghosting, uh, while not great, it doesn't have any bleed through whatsoever. However, many of you guys have seen my uh, review of the uh, 2014 uh, printed ESV Heritage in the True Tone, in the brown True Tone. That Bible has absolutely horrendous paper. It cockles in the middle. That's mostly due to the tight binding. But it also has some plasticky feeling paper. The ghosting is horrible. Uh, an even worse example is actually same company, Crossways ESV single column personal size heirloom Bible. This was supposed to be the first of their Chinese premiums and it was really expensive. Uh, if it's going to be a premium Bible, it has to have good paper, but it had horrible, the same plasticky, really thin paper and it had a tremendously bad uh, bleed through in, in the Bible page. And so usually ghosting doesn't bother me that much. Personally, it's not a huge issue for me. However, the bleed through was so bad in this Bible that it caused even the line match, this is a line match Bible, the line match text was so busy and so distracting, I couldn't even read it myself. I had to give that Bible away. <coughs> Luckily, my roommate who I gave it to didn't have any issues with that, <laughs> but me personally, I, could, I couldn't stand it. The ESV single column thin line has that same issue, and I'm sure there's a swath of other Bibles that you could potentially list. Um, that follows you where they're not great paper. But anyways, those were my 10 reasons. I apologize if uh, I aired out a lot of information there, but uh, I think it's important that we all voice our own opinions. If you disagree with me, please let me know down below. If you agree with me, I'd also like to hear what some of your reasons are 
for not liking these things. Uh, maybe some additional features you don't want to see in Bibles or even some features you would like to see in Bibles. I'd like to hear you, down, hear you say that down below. But anyways, thank you guys uh, so much for watching my, my videos lately. I'm so appreciative of the comments that you guys leave and then also the prayers um, that you guys have sent me. And so I'm very thankful. If you guys have anything to pray about um, that, that you need pray, prayer for, uh, please list it in the comments below. If it's private, you can email me at wontondisciple at gmail.com, wontondisciple at gmail.com. I'll put it in the description below. I also just got an Instagram, uh, mostly because I wanted to see all my fiance's posts. I like seeing her Instagram posts, so uh, I had to make an Instagram. Uh, but I do hope to post Bible-related content there soon, so feel free to follow me there, message me there um, if you'd like to do that. Anyways, thank you guys again. I will see you next week. Okay?